Tonight on The Body Politic, John Kerry and George Bush seize the podiums to sell themselves. Hello, I'm Michael Bernstein and this is The Body Politic. Tonight, we'll look at clips from the convention speeches of George Bush and John Kerry and sort through the messages that each man was trying to send as he made his case to be elected president. My guest is Gary Jacobson, a political scientist here at the University of California, San Diego, and a well-known expert on American politics. Gary, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Clearly, uh, two very effective speeches went over well with their audiences on the nights they were given, uh, but also uh, strategically thought through, focused on a particular segment of the electorate. Well, these are the most important speeches of the campaign so far, because this is the first time that both candidates will get large audiences of people who not, are not already on their side. So they, it's, a, it's an opportunity that they really don't want to blow. The election uh, has been has been seen as a very close one. All the polling data show uh, very close races. Uh, so it would appear that both candidates uh, in these uh, major national addresses were trying to appeal to those voters who were sitting the fence or not sure. Well, it's not so much that. It's, that's part of it. But uh, they were also trying to shore up what they had identified by their focus groups and polls as weaknesses uh, in their own campaigns and their own, uh, and own presentations of their cases for themselves. And so there's a lot of, uh, of kind of shoring up support among those who are um, in areas where people might be doubtful about them. Let's take a look at, at the speeches. Let's start with uh, Senator Kerry's speech uh, in Boston. Um, a very interesting speech, given that it was almost exclusively focused on international matters, national security, I mean, the kind of themes that, at least in the past, political scientists have usually identified with the Republican Party, uh, at least in the presidential races. Um, but I indeed, even from the very opening moments of the speech, a lot of military metaphors uh, entering the hall to uh, the sound of Bruce Springsteen's uh, No Defeat, No Surrender. I'm John Kerry, and I'm reporting for duty. Mine were Greatest Generation parents, and as I thank them, we all join together to thank a whole generation for making America strong, for winning World War II, winning the Cold War, and for the great gift of service which brought America 50 years of peace and prosperity. My parents, inspired me to serve. And when I was in high school, a junior, John Kennedy called my generation to service. It was the beginning of a great journey, a time to march for civil rights, for voting rights, for the environment, for women, for peace. We believed we could change the world. And you know what? We did. But we're not finished this journey. I am accompanied by an extraordinary band of brothers led by that American hero, a patriot called Max Cleland. Our band of brothers, our band of brothers doesn't march because of who we are as veterans, but because of what we learned as soldiers. I defended this country as a young man, and I will defend it as president. Let there be no mistake. I will never hesitate to use force when it is required. Any attack will be met with a swift and a certain response. I will never give any nation or any institution a veto over our national security, and I will build a stronger military. To all who serve in our armed forces today, I say help is on the way. See that flag? You see that flag up there? We call her Old Glory. The stars and stripes forever. I fought under that flag, as did so many of those people who are here tonight and all across the country. That flag flew from the gun turret behind my head, and it was shot through and through and tattered, but it never ceased to wave in the wind. Looking at these military metaphors that were literally throughout Senator Kerry's speech, uh, you're suggesting, Gary, that 
his handlers, his strategists believed that this was an area of weakness for his campaign, that he needed to somehow project more strength on these issues? Not so much for him in particular, but any, I think the Democrats figured out a long time ago, months ago, years ago, a year ago, two years ago, that there's no way they could win this election unless they could convince uh, a substantial majority of the American people that they would be no less safe or, or no less vigorously defended against terrorism uh, with the Democrat in the White House than with Bush in the White House. And Kerry's uh, taking of the nomination uh, happened primarily because he made that case most, most uh, powerfully to Democrats. Uh, and he realized, and his party realized, he also has to make that case to a broader segment of the American people, at least the independent uh, people who haven't made up their mind. So he see that, saw this as, the Democrats see this as an historical weakness ever since the Vietnam War, the perception that they're not as tough on national defense issues as the Republicans are. After 9-11, a party that can't convince the American people that its candidate is going to be as tough on terrorists as the Bush administration has been, just doesn't have a chance to win. So this was, this was taking a direct aim at something that he had to convince the American people of uh, if he had any chance to win at all. And I think that's why we saw so much of it. And you mentioned uh, focus groups. So uh, these speeches, uh, this speech, and indeed the president's speech, which we'll look at in a moment, uh, these uh, various portions of the speech are tested before select audiences oh, by the strategists. And these are uh, multi-million dollar, multi uh, hundreds of million do dollar campaigns. Uh, and of course, they're going to uh, mark, they're going to test their, their pitches, just like any kind of advertising firm is, on test markets of various kinds because they want to they wanna do it right. And, and they don't know instinctively, necessarily, what the right approach is. So all of this is tested out very carefully. One irony, of course, that since this speech was given and as the campaigns proceeded, we'll see this, uh, we'll return to this point again, uh, looking at the president's speech. Um, Senator Kerry's been a bit on the defensive when it comes to military matters ever since and been attacked for his own record well, in the Vietnam War and his criticism of the war and so forth. The logic of the attack follows the logic of his case. That is, if, if, if he has to make the case to win, that he's going to be tough enough, uh, and he uses his Vietnam War experience to make that case, then the logic suggests that the, his opponents will try to attack him on that. Uh, and the, the, swift, the swift boat uh, veterans campaign with uh, no doubt subtle help from the Republican National Committee and its friends there uh, aimed at taking him down on that area where he was trying to project himself as strong on defense. So, so uh, that's his strength. They attack his strength. So you're also suggesting that if perhaps the speech had not been so focused on national security matters, the military metaphors, maybe this would not have been an, a, an agenda that the uh, Bush campaign could have exploited? No, I think that they anticipated that Kerry would use this and that they had, uh, and it was anticipated that this was a good place to attack him on because if he, if he couldn't survive that, if he, if he weren't tough on defense, if he were um, not, uh, if he couldn't use that experience to show that he too had defended America and would be a strong defender of America, then he would have a hard time winning. And I think that they would have done it regardless of what he said at the convention. Let's turn to another uh, interesting image or theme that uh, uh, Kerry focused on at Boston, a kind of populist message about uh, America uh, being independent of uh, foreign energy sources, of uh, being independent from uh, meddling in its domestic politics uh, uh, by uh, foreign governments. And uh, let's take a look for a moment at one segment of the speech. We value an America that controls its own destiny because it's finally and forever independent of Mideast oil. What does it mean for our economy and our national security? when we have only 3% of the world's oil reserves, yet we rely on foreign countries for 53% of what we consume. I want an America that relies on its ingenuity and innovation, not the Saudi royal family. An interesting mixture of messages here. A lot of emphasis on national security uh, and the military metaphors. Here, a message about making America independent of foreign energy sources, when in fact we have troops all over the world fighting a fight against terrorism and to try and make sure that our oil supplies are secure. How does the uh, Kerry campaign put these two messages together like this? Well, I think the, the main point of that, that excerpt we saw was a kind of a dig at the Bush administration and their connection with the Bush family with the Saudis uh, and with a very, very uh, indirect but 
real reference to 9-11, since a number of the flyers were Saudis. Um, the notion of energy independence, of course, is also a, a critique indirect, but a critique of the Bush administration's energy policy, which was uh, strictly focused on, almost strictly focused on uh, fossil fuels and, and greater extraction. Uh, Kerry wants to claim that he's going to lead a charge toward other kinds of energy sources that will make us energy independent. Um, didn't say how he was going to do it. Uh, but the, the notion of not being dependent on the Saudis, I think, is quite attractive, and he was making that point. Yeah, and, and as you're suggesting, could actually dovetail with the national security message, saying to the extent the nation is less dependent on these foreign sources, perhaps some of these dangers can be attenuated? True, but, uh, but from the point of view of the war on terrorism, uh, that doesn't, that that's, can be disconnected from oil. I mean, it may not be, but in, in fact, uh, the, the connection, terrorism might be there without oil, and therefore he can't say no, that if we're energy independent, we're therefore going to be safe. I, he couldn't make that claim, and I don't think he meant to. Uh, just before we turn to uh, President Bush's speech, uh, is it your sense uh, that now, with uh, approximately two months left, or a little less than two months left in the presidential campaign, that these themes will continue to be the focus of the Kerry campaign, national security, the military metaphors, and the populist message we saw? I think that uh, we'll hear more on domestic policy. Uh, I think that both there'll be a, a, a constant reference to uh, national defense because it's it, it's crucial to to his victory if he's to any vict hope he has a victory, but I think he has to expand beyond that uh, and give Democrats a good reason to turn out for him uh, and to. Uh, differentiate himself on the domestic front from the Bush administration. So in part, the domestic message becomes a way to get the party base uh, yes. to turn out on, on November 2nd. Well, let's talk about uh, President Bush's speech uh, at New York. I mean, here, uh, indeed, a lot of emphasis on domestic issues, not so much on uh, the international scene or on national security. Uh, first, uh, very early in the speech, uh, taking up the question of economic anxieties, uh, but also trying to link that with notions of new economic uh, opportunity. Let's, let's take a look. The times in which we work and live are changing dramatically. The workers of our parents' generation typically had one job, one skill, one career, often with one company that provided health care and a pension. And most of those workers were men. Today, workers change jobs, even careers, many times during their lives. And in one of the most dramatic shifts our society has seen, two-thirds of all moms also work outside the home. Many of our most fundamental systems, the tax code, health coverage, pension plans, worker training, were created for the world of yesterday, not tomorrow. We will transform these systems so that all citizens are equipped, prepared, and thus truly free to make your own choices and pursue your own dreams. So here, it seems the president quite, uh, quite adroitly took the question of economic change and even economic anxieties that the Kerry campaign is has highlighted uh, off and on uh, throughout the summer and turned it into a message about opportunity, uh, the potential for change, even looking at the matter of social security, pensions, pension systems, uh, and health care. Um, so in that sense, a, a moderate message, not, a, not a, a, a vastly conservative message. I mean, a desire to speak to some of the themes that the Democrats have highlighted in the past. Well, again, I think he was shoring up a weakness. Uh, the major Problem, one of the major problems the administration has faced is the lack of job growth. Uh, he's going to come... A lot of criticism yeah, about that. The, uh, he will, it'll be the first administration since Hoover where there's been a net loss of jobs. Uh, and that's a real political liability. What he's trying to do is to say, number one, in that I feel your pain. I understand the world has changed. Everybody works. Um, the, 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 you're no longer, you, don't, you don't have job security. You can't count on it. So he recognizes the problem. That's... that's part of the message. And then the second part is that these policies he's going to propose that are quite conservative economic policies uh, will in fact benefit everybody somewhere down the road. That they're, adjust they're not just uh, you know, making life better for the rich by cutting their taxes and by um, uh, you know, allowing people to put money into the stock market from their social security, but they're in fact necessary to, to uh, respond to these new realities. So it's, it's a way of framing 
uh, the proposals he's going to make on the economy in terms that are uh, should have the broadest appeal, or hopes will have the broadest appeal. Well, indeed, there were, one didn't see any mention of trickle-down economics, of you know, uh, tax cuts or other strategies that might privilege the upper ends of the income distribution and then generate growth for everybody. Uh, instead, we had the emergence of a kind of new discourse about an ownership society. Let's uh, let's just see uh, the president's statement on this point. Another priority for a new term is to build an ownership society, because ownership brings security and dignity and independence. In an ownership society, more people will own their health care plans and have the confidence of owning a piece of their retirement. We'll always keep the promise of Social Security for our older workers. With the huge baby boom generation approaching retirement, many of our children and grandchildren understandably worry whether Social Security will be there when they need it. We must strengthen Social Security by allowing younger workers to save some of their taxes in a personal, personal account, a nest egg you can call your own and government can never take away. In all these proposals, we seek to provide not just a government program, but a path, a path to greater opportunity, more freedom, and more control over your own life. So the president here is clearly remaining loyal to the conservative agenda, but he seems to have uh, mellowed the message. He's not saying government is bad, the source of all your problems is government. He's saying that a new approach will allow you the opportunity to pursue ownership, independence, security on your own. Isn't that a new a new strategy in this campaign? It's, no, it actually goes back to 2000. It, it, some of these themes were, were there all along. Not much has been done about them along the way. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a way of arguing that policies that um, reduce government control, uh, set up mechanisms that are more market-oriented, say, for investing your social, some of your Social Security money or um, in uh, savings accounts for medical care and so forth, trying to Turn it into a turn. Some turn to the market as a as a mechanism that conservatives like, while claiming that it's good for everybody. That, that everybody will benefit from ownership. Everybody will benefit from from uh, medical savings accounts and so forth. Um, those are debatable points, uh, and he doesn't really address the problem of costs, which of course is the the kicker in all these uh, entitlement programs. However you look at them, whatever side you take, that's not addressed by any of them very seriously. Uh, but I think it's a, it's strategically wise to couch what you're going to do in the broadest most popular terms, and that's what he was doing, and, and quite effectively in those parts of his speech. And, and it, it's also interesting that what is a typically conservative message about the market and independent competition in the market, the focus here is not on, you know, let the race go to the swiftest, there will be winners and losers. The focus instead is, you know, the opportunities for ownership, independence, indeed, the, the opportunities to win in the competition, although, as you say, there are no detailed specifics about how that might occur for a majority of the population. Of course, but that's been the defense of market capitalism for, for two centuries. For two <laughs> centuries, right, right. Even though the message might have been packaged in ways that's, uh, that appeals to the center and obviously looking to persuade voters sitting the fence or wondering about which way to turn in November, the president did take time in this speech uh, to speak directly to his right flank, to his conservative base uh, on social and, and cultural issues. Uh, interested in your opinion of that, let's take a look at this portion of the speech. My opponent recently announced that he's the, conservative, uh, the candidate of conservative values. <laughs> must have come as a surprise to a lot of his supporters. <laughs> There's some problems with this claim. If you say the heart and soul of America is found in Hollywood, I'm afraid you are not the candidate of conservative values. <laughs> you voted against the Bipartisan Defense of Marriage Act, which President Clinton signed. You are not the candidate of conservative values. If you gave a speech, as my opponent did, calling the Reagan presidency eight years of moral darkness, then you may be a lot of things, but the candidate of conservative values is not one of them. So here the president has uh, certainly addressed uh, concerns of the uh, 
far right in, the, in his party uh, about cultural values under assault from Hollywood, about gay rights, about efforts to legalize uh, gay marriage, uh, got in the swipe about uh, the Reagan years, of course, the death of President Reagan uh, uh, being mourned at the Republican convention. Uh, and uh, elsewhere in the speech, we didn't see it in this clip, but elsewhere in the speech he does address the question of the, the rights of an unborn child, so he's addressing the uh, reproductive choice um, um, issue. So clearly, uh, whatever the other strategies of this speech might have been, the need to speak to the conservative base, uh, the right-wing base in the Republican Party uh, was clearly on the President's mind and that of his strategists. Oh yes, I mean, he couldn't ignore them completely in the speech. He has to remind them that he's on their side. But he had to do it in such a way that he didn't offend people who are not necessarily Christian conservatives, but uh, who, who, who might uh, be moderate or uh, moderately conservative, but aren't zealous about it. So he couldn't pick examples that were, um, I mean, he didn't talk about stem cell research, for example, something that's more controversial where public opinion isn't on his side. He chose things where public opinion is on his side, right. which is, you know, makes, makes good sense when you're trying to both uh, signal to your base that uh, you're, you're, you're straight and true, but also to signal to the center but that, that you're, not a, you're, you're not a zealot, you're not a fanatic. And then clearly on the, these three uh, highlighted points in the clip, uh, Hollywood, the Defense of Marriage Act, the Reagan years, these are all areas where the polls indicate uh, you know, a, a real split of opinion, and many people undecided or confused on the issues. Uh, people are disturbed about some of the things that go on in Hollywood. People are confused and disturbed on the issue of gay marriage. And uh, the Reagan years uh, statement, I mean, uh, after all, the man died earlier in the summer, and so people feel that attacks on him or his administration are probably out of order at this point. So uh, I take your point that the president was uh, getting some landing some punches here while at the same time sending a clear message to his to his right wing. Uh, finally, the, the speech, uh, on the speech, the president's speech, the, the president does uh, manage to take up a military theme toward the end of the speech and here uh, in his role as commander-in-chief and he does so in, a, in an emotional and poignant way. Let's take a look at that. I've met with the parents and wives and husbands who have received a folded flag and said a final goodbye to a soldier they loved. I am awed that so many have used those meetings to say that I'm in their prayers and to offer encouragement to me. Where does that strength like that come from? How can people so burdened with sorrow also feel such pride? It is because they know their loved one was last seen doing good. Because they know that liberty was precious to the one they lost. And in those military families, I have seen the character of a great nation, decent, idealistic, and strong. President here seems to be uh, trumping uh, Senator Kerry on military matters. He is the commander in chief. He can speak about the costs of of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, in a way depriving Senator Kerry of, of this issue, no? I think it was more, uh, he was, another, it was another I feel your pain statement. That, I mean, the critique of the war, the uh, war is becoming increasingly unpopular. And the question that gets the lowest support for the war is a polling question asking, uh, was it, has it been worth the cost in American lives? And he takes that on directly in this, this excerpt. Uh, he he, ta he ta shows he, that he's sympathetic with the families and the soldiers, uh, and then tries to make the argument that they ha still have the pride because it was worth it, because they're defending freedom. So he's trying to shore up a weakness in his, uh, in his policy, uh, or in the, constant, in the public opinion on his policy, uh, taking it on very directly, and being able to, to do this from the position, of course, as commander in chief, which never hurts. Where do you see the... Uh the campaign's headed in this last uh, month and a half. Basically, the, the themes we've been uh, looking at in these clips from the two convention speeches, I think that that will be the major thrust of the messages, or do you see some change in, in focus? I, I ex uh, expect some change. I, I think that the focus on Vietnam on both sides is, is not going to dominate the next two months. I don't think it can. I think there's going to be shift, uh, shifting over to, to more focus on uh, domestic alternatives. Uh, and all of this, of course, predicated on the assumption that nothing dramatic is going to happen. Um, we could have another terrorist attack. Osama bin Laden could be captured. Um, 
There may be something like a Tet Offensive in uh, Iraq. There's all sorts of possibilities out there that uh, we just can't uh, anticipate accurately. And any one of them could uh, shift the, the, the t tone and the focus of the campaign quite dramatically. So we live in a time where there are lots of possibilities of uncertain cha is it, changes. Is, is it reasonable to assume uh, that, uh, say, a major offense, you say the equivalent of a Tet Offensive in Iraq or Afghanistan or uh, uh, a terrorist action within the United States or in, a, in an allied nation, or the capture of Osama bin Laden, uh, that any of these events would powerfully strengthen the Bush candidacy for re-election? Well, certainly the capture of bin Laden would. Um, the a, a Tet Offensive in Iraq would probably weaken it. That is, the, insofar as this is evidence that the policy has, isn't working, uh, that we went in there with too little, uh, that we didn't anticipate what the consequences were going to be very, uh, very well. Um, that would feed into the, the, the argument that this was a misguided venture, I think. A terrorist attack you know, cuts two ways. I think that in the short run, uh, it would rally people around the president like the, the attack of 9-11 did and, and politically would, would be very difficult for Kerry to deal with. Um, in the long run, then the question is raised, well, you didn't defend us from terrorism. Uh, here's, here's another attack that there's been a failure somewhere within this administration. You know, three years later, there's another one. Uh, but it would have to do on, a lot to do in the timing, how much time after the camp, after it happened, after the event. people would have to get over the shock and the initial rally around the flag experience to then start asking the serious questions. And the closer we get to the election, the less time there is for that to, uh, to, to occur. One final question, Gary, the hardest question I'm going to ask you uh, this evening. Prediction for November 2nd? Well, my, my uh, take all along has been it's going to look a lot like 2000. We're going to have a very close election. Uh, we may be waiting for some time before finding out the results. Uh, I think if that's not the case, then Bush will be the winner. I don't think there's going to be a, a dramatic shift to Kerry, simply because Republican support for Bush, among ordinary Republican support for Bush, is overwhelming. It's just 95 percent. It's very high, and that's not going to go away, I don't think, no matter what happens. So I think Bush has a better upside than Kerry does. Uh, he, he has a better chance of pulling away some Democrats. Um, but I think that the, you know, Kerry was ahead by two or three points a couple of weeks ago. Bush is ahead by about five points now if you average the polls since his, his um, nomination. I think we're going to shift back to the equilibrium 50-50 point um, uh, before the election, before election day, and it's going to be a very, very close call. Uh, you know, there's going to be very intense campaign, which of course Californians won't see at all, uh, because the campaigns aren't going to take place in California. They're going to California is not regarded as a battleground state. It's, uh, the, the Bush campaign has essentially written California off. Well, they should. If, if, they, if they need it to win the electoral vote, they're not going to win it. And if they win it, they're not going to need it. So it makes no point for them to actually invest any resources in California. Well, we'll see on November 2nd. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. My guest has been Gary Jacobson, an expert on American politics and a professor of political science at the University of California, San Diego. Thank you all for joining us on The Body Politic. I'm Michael Bernstein. Good night. <laughs>